and a very good evening to you and welcome to this evening's edition of Politics 101. David Hines here, of course, it's on a Wednesday evening in Guyana. I'm on the East Coast in Buxton, and uh, we are going to be continuing the conversation this evening um, on the big issue in the news. Of course, uh, we continue to talk about the developments over the last couple of days, um, whereby we had uh, um, uh, three police officers who were charged and brought before the courts for the murder of uh, Quinton, uh, Quinton Bacchus from Golden Grove. One policeman charged for murder and two others charged for obstructing justice. And uh, that conversation we started last night we had GHK Lal and um, Henry Jeffrey on quite a big show last night. And tonight, we're going to continue that discussion. But we're going to start off tonight um, with uh, um, uh, talking about the Sun Chapman incident, 1964, um, uh, uh, number of uh, <coughs> residents of Linden <coughs> were murdered when the launch that they were traveling with was blown up. 1964, of course, is a pivotal year in our um, history. Um, it was uh, uh, the period of ethnic strife starting in 1961, um, 1964. Shortly after that, we had a change in government, uh, but um, the memory of that period continue, continues to haunt us, um, largely because there are two narratives of what happened during that period that happens whenever there is ethnic strife. Um, both sides in the conflict um, construct their own narratives. And we have been hearing lots of um, explanations and interpretations of what happened between 1961 and 1964. Um, and we are gonna be revisiting the Sun Chapman incident and then pivoting into um, our uh, discussion, continuing the discussion on the um, development surrounding the murder of young Quindon Bacchus. Welcome politics 101 if you're joining us from guyana welcome if you join us from linden if you join us from linden welcome to politics 101 you're joining us from the caribbean the wider caribbean welcome to politics 101 if you are joining us uh, from uh, north america europe uh if you're there in south america where we are geographically located i'm talking about our brothers and sisters in um, <clears throat> Armarabo, Nikeri, some people say Nikeri, there in Suriname, and of course, the brothers and sisters in French Guyana. French Guyana, welcome. Welcome down to Politics 101. What we do here every evening is that we um, continue to mobilize. We're not just sitting here talking, we continue to mobilize. Part of mobilization, of course, is um, exchanging information, analysis, of course, um, and uh, of course, what we do is that we move beyond just uh, throwing what they call red meat. They say that we spend our time on social media, um, uh, uh, spreading all kinds of violence and all that kind of stuff. And I always invite them to come on down, come on down here every evening, Politics 101. And here we are not hiding, we are um, in the open space and we are talking about issues and events that impact the lives of all Guyanese, but in particular, the audience which follows us and that is in the majority supporters of the opposition. So welcome, please share the link. Share the link, we've been 
very proud of ourselves. In the last three weeks or so, we have been meeting our target and going beyond. Last night, we went up to 1,700, which was um, 700 above our 1,000 target. So we are not doing too badly in terms of our audience. So tonight, my guests are going to be Hamilton Green, former prime minister, longstanding executive member of the People's National Congress, served in various capacities um, during the government, um, the period when the PNC held office. But um, he reached the office of prime ministers, we know the prime minister's second in command um, in the hierarchy of our government. Um, but more than that, I mean, has been involved on the ground. He was one of those ministers that um, did not confine himself to the office, but spent a, long, a lot of time on the ground. And more than that, um, even before he semi-retired from politics, he's what we may call a, a native historian. Um, someone was always taking an active interest in our history as written, on historical moments. And so he's quite qualified to speak on what happened during the 1960s, and in particular, the Sun Chapman um, event. And later on, we are going to be joined by um, Shama Solomon, former chairman of Region 10. Um, he's going to try and join us a little bit later on too. So welcome, welcome down to Politics 101, we continue, we continue to monitor the situation. The latest call we are hearing is for a reopening, a reopening of the um, investigation into the murder of Quindon Bacchus. There are questions, there are questions. Obviously, it was clear to all of us who looked at the video uh, that there were more than three police officers on the scene. Three of them were charged. What happened to the others? We are hearing that there were about seven of them. What happened to the other four? Why were they not charged? What role did they play? That is very important. We are hearing that there is a particular rank who was there and who may have fired the majority of the shots. He was not charged. We're asking why. We're asking why. If that is true, why? The other big question we're asking is, who was the functional superior that gave the order for that operation? Who was the functional officer, the functional, the functional superior? We are arguing that these policemen would not have carried out an operation like that, a sting operation, on their own. Everyone that we have talked to who understands how the police force works says that the command, the order may have come from somewhere. We are hearing that uh, the policemen, some of them, in their testimony, during the investigation by the Police Complaints Authority, did say who gave them the orders to carry out the information, carry out the operation. And if that evidence is included in the report by the chairman of the Police Complaints Authority, then why that functional superior was not charged? He or she is equally culpable or perhaps more culpable than the young police officers that were on the scene. We are hearing and we have heard in court um, that one of the officers who was charged said that he was pressured to give evidence. He was pressured not to give evidence, sorry. Um, he was pressured to lie and now he's charged with obstructing justice. We have heard, contrary to what the police said in an earlier statement, that 
Quinlan Barker shot at the policemen. We now hear from the prosecution that the gun that was allegedly in the possession of Quinlan Barker was not working. And so therefore no round was shot from that gun. So all of this says to us that although charges have been brought, these charges perhaps are meant to further cover up. Uh, Dr. Jeffrey said on this program last night, and he should know he served in government and we're gonna have Hamilton Green later on, um, that in situations like this, the police do the barest minimum and they hope that uh, that quiets the situation. We have had instances in the recent past. We go back to the Henry Boyce case where the police may have intentionally charged people who they know did not commit the crime as a way of satisfying the families that they have instituted charges while at the same time covering up the real criminals. So with that experience, with those experiences, we are obviously very careful about becoming complacent with the charges. We are demanding, we are demanding a reopening of the investigations to address these questions. That's where we are. In the meantime, the people of Golden Grove, Nabaclis and Aslington continue to keep vigil. They continue to stand in the open space. And they continue to build the movement that we have asked for. That we are no longer just protesting. What we are doing is we're building a wide movement to bring back sanity and humanity to our country. We are building a movement that demands structural changes in the police force. We are building a movement that demands a change in the culture of the police force. That the police force must return to its mandate as an agency that is responsible for service and protection. That the police force is not a killing force that it's a force for the protection of human beings. Our movement is a movement to end the economic genocide against sections of our population. It's a movement to end economic discrimination. It's a movement to bring about equitable distribution of a new fund economic wealth. It's a movement that says that our economy must move from an economy of handouts to an economy that caters to the needs of our people. And the immediate need of our people must be the reduction, the massive reduction of poverty. Our movement is an anti-poverty movement. Our movement demands a return to the political stability that we saw between 19, between 2015 and 2020. Say what you want about the Granger administration. I would be the first person to admit that big mistakes were made. But I am the first to say, and I said it then and I'm saying it again, that it was an example, that government was an example of how a government should protect the human rights of its citizens. There were no political assassinations, no harassment of the opposition. There were none of those things, the human rights and the human dignity of our people were upkept by that government. And so we are demanding that the return to rogue government, the return to the criminal state and the criminalized state, our movement is a movement for a decriminalization 
of the state. Our movement is a movement against corruption in high places and low places. We note that the president went to Monripo and began to share from personal, not personal, Okay, we're back, we're back, we're back. They seem to be playing tricks with us. They did it to us last night and again, but we're back, we're back. I was saying the president went to Monrepo and gave out money, shared out money, not from his personal bank account, but from the country's bank account, without any due, due diligence. Then go through the agencies that are responsible for finance. He shared out money. We are arguing that that is illegal that if you're spending government money, regardless of what you are spending on, whether you are compensating people or not, it must be done lawfully. And what the president did uh, was unlawful. Not the giving of the compensation, but the way in which he shared out the money as if he was sharing out his own money. Our movement is against all of that. So sisters and brothers, we continue to build, to build our movement. And uh, tonight we're gonna continue that discourse. Let me bring in um, Hamilton Green. He has been waiting patiently as I do my usual opening um, sermon, as some people call it. <laughs> um, Hamilton Green, how are you doing, boy? Thank you. First of all, David, let me congratulate you. What you've done tonight and what you've been doing over the past few months, uh, th these are commendable. We need to do some more of it. 
And if there's any way that some of us can subscribe to get these programs to a wide audience, I am prepared to help because unless we can educate, particularly our young people, to pass information on to them, they lack the stimulus to agitate so that we can be truly liberated. And we need to be liberated. That's my mantra at the moment. Educate so that we can agitate to liberate. And there are too many young people out there, Afro, Indo, and others, who are unaware of our past, and therefore they are the sea of nonsense. And we've got a duty, as you are doing, to give them information so they can advance as credible Guyanese to make this country a safer and a better place. And, and I want to thank you also, Hami, for your continued efforts to assist in the continuing molding of our nation. You are no longer an active politician, but you continue to lend of your wisdom and your experience. Um, as they say, you have not ridden off into the sunset and uh, sit in your rocking chair and forget about the world around you. And, and I must say <clears throat> that I always, whenever I speak with you and the others in the PNC to say, we have come such a long way uh, because three, four decades ago, we were on different sides of the political fence. We um, confronted, our parties confronted um, one another. And that is not unusual in uh, any country in the world. There have always been contestation of ideas and um, what independence should be. But here we are, 30, 40 years later, um, uh, agitating, to use your term, for some of the shared ideals. And in my, in my estimation, that is not a sign of weakness, but a sign of maturity. It shows that our society has matured. Do right, you right. wish to comment? Hmm? Yes. So, um, I mean, let's let's go back in time. You, you know, some people say that we should forget history. Let us forget the past and let us look forward. Um, are you hearing me? You can't. I, yes, yes, go ahead. And unless we can connect yesterday to today, we lack the intellectual stimulation to craft a safe tomorrow. Uh, I heard a certain gentleman at an Emancipation Day ceremony look in the face of a set of black people and say they should forget history. When his name was crafted out of the European plantation, as my name is. And we have to debunk that nonsense, that ignorance, and educate our young people. In 1964, uh, when the Sun Chapman incident took place, you probably know I was general secretary of the party and had earlier been to Wismar, Christianburg, Mackenzie community to bring back calm to the problems they had as a result of disturbances. And this came about, and I wrote a letter recently, because at the mines, the majority of workers there came out of the Maikoni, Mahaika area. And daily, there were a receipt of reports of them being brutalized by certain people. The last one, which I think um, sparked that exploded in Mackenzie Linden, Mackenzie Wisma at that time, was report that an Afro Guyanese had his parts dismembered, tied in um, barbed wire, and put into the Mycone Creek. And this created problems. I went in there with Burnham and Aaron and others to bring calm. But you must remember that in June, just when things were settling down, or trying to settle down, there was the Abraham family 
murder. A fire was set to Arthur Abraham's home in Hatfield Street. And we need to remind those who are trying to rewrite history that Arthur Abraham was one of those highly respected public servants, um, what we call Anglo-Saxon heritage. He was the permanent secretary to the office of the premier. That was Dr. Jacob. And all of a sudden, because they assumed he was close to the coalition and Peter de Gare, he was, in the words of the PP mirror, promoted uh, from being PS of the premier's office to PS at works. The absurdity of that is palpable. And therefore, Arthur Abraham in June, a month before, was killed with seven of his children lost their lives. His wife and one daughter jumped through the window and they survived. After that, um, troubles continued in the mining town. And at the inquiry, a certain highly placed official at Film House said that they had a gift for the people of Mackenzie Wisma. Was that gift the bomb placed in the St. Chapman, a launch owned by an Afro Guyanese PNC supporter? Placed there, the evidence brought out very clear by a gentleman known as Pariman. He did not travel. He put the paddy, the bag of paddy near the engine room, and all this came out in the inquiry, and left and was known to have visited that place in Rock Street on two separate occasions. So you've heard this nonsense from certain highly placed sources about the source of the dynamite and the bombing. That bombing took the lives of almost 50 all afro guyanese When I got the news, I jumped in my Jeep, drove to the trail as I was on a horse, and met the residents and tried to calm the place again. When I got there, we saw bodies popping out of the river, including one of the Carol's family who was pregnant and it's a scene I don't want to talk about. It was horrible. And that, of course, ignited some more trouble in that and other communities. We should remember St. Chapman in the context that we must learn from our mistakes. And if we want this so-called one Guyana, our leaders must recognize that justice must be the linchpin and decency the armor plate to take Guyana forward. And this business of sharing out money, as you said, is not only illegal, it is highly suspicious. And because when you give money out like that, and I sent a letter which I believe was published, if a certain person claimed to have lost a million dollars in dog pool in one day, I <clears> posed <throat> the question, is that person paying income tax? Yes. Because that's more than any policeman, soldier, fireman, or public servant earns. So this unhappy effort by the Ali administration is inconsistent with the need to build a Guyana where we can all be free and benefit from the God-given resources we have. I, I mean, let, let, me, let me take you back to the 1960s because um, in fairness to our younger people and in fairness to historical accuracy, there were two major um, uh, incidents. There was the incidence of violence and that started around May, um, May 26, um, which um, uh, people on the opposition side have dubbed um, the massacre um, of 
of Indian Guyanese. Um, I've heard the word genocide used recently by some Indian Guyanese, schol so Indian Guyanese scholars um, who have said <clears throat> there was the um, expulsion of Indians from Mackenzie. They were beaten, they were robbed, they were um, uh, massacred, and they speak about the silence on the part of African Guyanese scholars and leaders about that activity. Even as they silence some government, because I listened to those scholars on Globespan, and they talked only about the, what they refer to as the massacre of Indians and no mention of Sun Chapman. Can you reflect on that incident that they are dubbing the massacre of Indians or the genocide of Indians? Well, I explained that earlier what happened at uh, Mackenzie Wismo. It is a consequence of the brutality meted out to many of the mine, mine workers in the mines who hailed from the Mahaika Maikoni area. Yes. And the, the incident that created the thing was when they found an afro Guyanese wrapped in barbed wire with his genitals dismembered. And that was something that sparked. And there were some remarks, rude remarks made by certain people in the Wisma, certain Indo businessmen. And that created a reaction. It's a human reaction. And uh, not justified, but a reaction. And as I said earlier, we went up there immediately and asked the folks to be quiet. And we got them to return to their homes and to help those who were um, dispossessed. Later, the um, state of emergency was declared because when some Chapman came, it sort of undid, if I can use that term, all that we tried to do to bring calm. Sun Chapman was a serious matter. Would, would you say Sun Chapman was a retaliation for um, what happened on May 26th? Well, that's what I said. A certain yeah. Iowa been house said <laughs> that gift to the people of Wisdom. This came out in the inquiry. In the inquiry. And I assume that was the gift to which they alluded. Yeah, uh, I, I mean, I, I, I um, interviewed um, an elder. I'm not going to call his name because um, I did not alert him that I um, was going to um, call his name. But he um, is of the firm view that Mrs. Jagan, who was then the Home Affairs Minister, Home Affairs Minister um, did not act swiftly. Um, when that incident occurred and may have allowed it um, to exacerbate for political reasons. Um, have you heard that interpretation and um, from your memory, would you say that it's, it's accurate or near to accurate? It is quite accurate. In yeah. fact, it dates back a year and a half before uh, 1964, when the school bus was bombed by a known PP activist on the East Coast when the boy um, Ferreira was- Ferreira was, was that in Triumph or Lusik Man? Triumph, no? Uh, I think, I don't remember the exact village, mm. but there, there's a school bus. Yes, I, I remember the, I know the, of the incident. Well, since you call Mrs. Jagan's name, I can call her name too. Yeah. The, we talked about it. She said, they did not mourn for Kausila. And Kausila was run over by a tractor quite by accident during a protest on the West Demarara. When the thing became so worrisome, they then published an apology the next week in the party paper Mirror and apologized for the remark which said they did not mourn for Kausila. These were innocent, mainly Portuguese children who were not involved the struggle then, and then they throw the school bus out. So that uh, it's that narrative is quite accurate. It's a terrible time. 
And it's a I'm, same thing. Yeah, each you go ahead, go ahead at me. Uh -huh. We try to bring calm, not only to the wisdom, Christian world community, but throughout this country, because we wanted peace so that we can move to the next constitutional position as we headed for independence. Uh, I mean, what, uh, 40 odd years later, uh, 50 years later, 60 years later, we are almost 60 years later, six decades, what are the lessons from the disturbances in general in 1961 to 1964? Um, and uh, the incidents in Lynn, in well, Mackenzie, Wisma Mackenzie, at that time it was named, um, both the Sun Chapman incident and the, um, the, the, the incident yeah, yeah. that is dubbed the expulsion of, um, of Indians. What are, the, what are the big hard lessons as a nation that we should learn from that period? The major lesson is that we came here in different ships, as one man said. We're now in the same boat. And we've got to re-engineer that tolerance that existed when Afro-Guyanese taught Indo-Guyanese, when Afro-Guyanese midwives safely delivered Indo-Guyanese women. We've got to return to that time when we must recognize that in all of this, the common enemy are the imperialists who exploited us, brought us here as slaves, brought the Indians, the Chinese and the Portuguese uh, to, uh, uh, well, in those days, you could say scab labor, to replace the labor on the plantations. But in spite of that, the afro guyanese was always kind and tolerant to other people, always. And there is no period in history when they did not act unless they were pushed and provoked. And in the case of what you may term genocide against black people, you or history would know there are two segments of the struggle during and immediately after slavery. One where the Africans, because they were given the Quran and the Bible in particular circumstances, consider themselves submissive. At another time, they were combative. And they only became combats when they were pushed, 1763, 1823. And this is the history of the afro guyanese in Guyana and the indo guyanese must understand that and recognize that speaking for myself, David Hines and others, we only wish to work together in peace. And now that we have this new found um, wealth that those in charge must understand, it must be evenly distributed, not what we see happening today. And if you give somebody a little more, you have to give it to the African Guyanese who dug all those canals along the coast when there were no bulldozers, who were whipped to work. And the others came as beneficiaries to that sacrifice. We've got to teach these things in school mm -hmm. so that our Indo, Chino, Portuguese mixed people will begin to appreciate the sacrifice of other people. And you know, in 1973, at the wrong table, the question was posed, why it is the African did not sacralize his suffering? Why he did not use his suffering into a political fund and therefore an economic resource? Others have done so. The Jews, the Chinese, the Jews, yeah. you know, and these are questions we need to pose to our young people mm. so they would understand we have to walk together in peace, but understanding we are now, as I said, we came in different ships, we know in the same boat. And the trouble is, you can have a, a local oligarchy, you know, 
developing with those with the big oil box. And at the end of the day, you and I will remain poor. I put in a letter. I've looked at the figures. The government can immediately double the salary of every policeman, every soldier, every fireman, every public servant, easily, even without renegotiations. But they're not going to do that. They want to go to ethical and other places and treat us like children, give us sweets. Mm -hmm. Stop the Cerberus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I mean, let, let me tell you, because there are lots of questions and comments here. My, my brother, Vibert, Vibert White from Grove, who I had the pleasure of spending um, uh, some um, uh, private time with in Buxton um, two days ago when he traveled from Grove with a, a contingent to be part of that demonstration. Mm -hmm. And he took the time to really grill me and, and so on. I remember him saying, be a good listener, be a good listener. Uh, um, Vibert is asking here, whether the murder of the two elderly people, and he's referring to the series about Buxton, was in any way linked um, to um, what happened at Linden with Mama Gen Z. You, you heard me there, Hami? Oh, you asked me the question? Yes, I'm asking you. It, it, was, it is a combination of events Good. taking place rapidly. And as I said, uh, I don't have evidence that that specific incident may have caused the eruption at Linden, at, at, well, it was Linden then. But what I know, it was being built up over time. Yeah. Because the majority of mine workers came from East Coast, West Coast to East. So when they hear, look, there was a time I attended a funeral in Boxton three, four times a week for people who were slaughtered. My namesake, Arthur Green, planting at the back of Hague, was shot and killed by a certain person who was eventually caught and charged. And there were marginal lines along the East Coast and West Demerara. And this divided people who grew up in peace, love, and comfort divided them it divided it divided them and there and we have to put an end to this stupidity yes yes and i mean um look in fairness um, let, well let me put it this way indian Guyanese scholars and leaders have created their own narratives of what happened during that time um african Guyanese scholars and leaders have created their own narrative of suffering. Both sides created a narrative of suffering, as you um, I mentioned, the why, uh, why African Guyanese have not turned their narratives of suffering into much more. But both sides have created their narratives of that period. Um, uh, you see, Kwayana uh, coined the term no guilty race. And they argued that there were times during that period when Indian Guyanese were the aggressors, and he cited 1961 and 1964. And then he said there were times when African Guyanese were the aggressors. And therefore, to point the finger at one ethnic group and to say that that ethnic group was guilty and the other one was innocent is wrong history, is immoral history. Where do you stand on that? I agree with you, Brian, on that I have written books, I've written letters saying that neither side were angels and neither side were all devils. We were caught up in the mix um, before and after independence. And a lot of this, don't for yourself, David, engineered by the plantocracy, you know. Yes, yes. They are experts at divide and rule. And because the afro Guyanese got the Bible, and one has to do this very carefully, they had an interpretation of what was right and what was wrong. And the, the, the white massa went to introduce Christianity to Afro-Guyanese as monumental Africans. 
it was not to make them good Christians, but to make them pliable to the machinations of the boss. After years of passage, both sides should recognize that they've got to stop yielding to the old divide and rule policy, which has existed for centuries, and which is, you see it in parts of Europe even today. And the lesson should be, yes, let's recount history, but let us know. My favorite thing is what Yasubazad once said. We came in different ships, but today we're in the same boat. Let's paddle like hell to heaven and to take advantage of this new bounty that the Creator has given us. And any government that fails to share that bounty must be dealt with condignly and seriously. Um, M M Mr. Green, uh, your government under Burnham made a tremendous effort uh, to um, bring some kind of ethnic peace to Guyana. Um, I think any fair analysis of our history would show that despite the fact that uh, you were a party of particularly African Guyanese, meaning so your support base with African Guyanese, that you made tremendous attempts to bring the ethnic groups together. Here we are 60 years later, and uh, uh, it seems as though those efforts uh, did not uh, um, bear the lasting fruits that you expected them um, to build. I want you to reflect, to reflect on the attempts, and I want you to take into consideration um, this question. After all that you did, after all that you tried, are you convinced that in these ethnic societies, that uh, despite the best efforts of one party that is grounded in one ethnicity, it is near impossible for any one party to bring our country together um, as one nation with one destiny? I am um, by nature an optimist. And I hope before I close my eyes. And there is evidence that the young people, particularly the young professionals on both sides of the ethnic divide, will recognize the futility of carrying on this up and down story, which started in the 50s, you know. And people forget that when the split came in the People's Progressive Party, the top Indo Guyanese came out batting for Burnham. Yes. Diana Ryan Singh, uh, Dr. Lashman Singh, and the other fellow from East Coast. But I don't want to call names. Somebody looked at the demographics, at the census, and said, hey, this is not a good thing for us. And that's how this Apanjat thing emerged. It started earlier. Daniel Debidian. You know, in. in, 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 in Place like South Georgetown, East Coast. Yeah. When um, Parak Singh started it, I, as a little boy, attended a meeting with my father, who was very popular in all boys' town. And he was asked to chair a meeting at the St. Thomas's School in Keckley Street. And Parak Singh broke off in Hindu, and somebody whispered to my father, he's talking race. My father held me by my hands and we walked out to that meeting. That is my first introduction to the nastiness of politics. I was a little fellow, I was seven, eight years old. Mm -hmm. And, and Hami, you mentioned that um, some of um, the major Indian Guyanese leaders um, uh, uh, went with Burnham at the split. They, some major African Guyanese leaders like the then Sydney King, Martin Carter, stayed with the PPP, but eventually left in a second split on the issue of race. 
And exactly. with the Federation, with Sidney King declaring that Dr. Jagan has lost confidence in the African executives of the party. And so therefore, go ahead, you go ahead. It has to be seen, David, in the context of our geopolitical environment. Remember, there's a very telling book written, says Confederation of the West Indies versus annexation to the United States. Uh -huh. Interesting document. And so when Federation loomed, and Federation, in fact, became a reality, it is my view as a young Turk at that time that some Indians, maybe not Dr. Jagan himself, but the racists in the party saw this as putting the indo guyanese as a, major, a minority in the wider West Indian world. Because remember, except for Trinidad, the other West Indian territories were 80, 90% afro guyanese Afro, afro based. Trinidad has a, still has a similar problem, uh, but uh, it is my view that some elements in that PP at the time saw confederation, therefore Jagan opposed federation. And remember that Pandit Jam Sharma came here in 1926 and met large groups of indo guyanese The largest meeting was at a place called Medemezorg. When they were asking for money to go back to India, he said, don't come back to India. We have difficulties there. Look at this land and try and own the land. He's, and he started it, Sharma, in 1926. I checked the records. Who owns the land, owns the country? And that has been, in part, uh, the, 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 the driving force behind some of the Indians wanting to own lands, while even though the Africans had an interest in land cooperative, we didn't have that emotional or cultural uh, seizure that um, existed in other parts. I mean, you, you, have, you have the people going to Ithaca to offer them music. I mean, what insult is that? Yeah. How many of that? Let's. I spoke to young people, yeah? And I believe that if you have a responsible government, and that's the big issue now, we can overcome this bridge. As Burnham once sang, the bridge over troubled water. Mm. Let's come to the present, Hami, and let's look at. Uh... Um, the most recent event here, incident here, the young man killed by police um, at Golden Grove. Um, uh, no attempt by the president to go and mourn and console uh, the community. Um, the people were out there for two and a half weeks. The national media did not go and talk to them. And the country continued as if nothing happened. And then last Tuesday, the people began to peacefully march. Um, and as they approach Monrepo, um, the police stopped the march there. No police was there in the march. The police were cordoning off the road at uh, Bivy police station. And then some individuals in the crowd, um, pounced upon East Indian and destroy East Indians, vendors there destroying their produce and so forth, um, um, stealing their things. And then the media descended. And the president went there within an hour or two. And they dubbed it a massacre. And leaving no doubt about the context in which they were talking about massacre, Africans massacring Indians. And then later that night, the police went to Golden Grove. 
bit the army in two and indiscriminately shot people in that village with pellets. There were some life wrongs destroying the church. Um, young people, children were <clears throat> injured. Um, to Guyana, to Guyana, Hamilton Green. Well, David, first of all, for me, the Monrepo incident was not by accident. Mm -hmm. I've been in business since I was 19 years old in 1953. I've gone through the machinations on both sides. I've lived through the Cold War. And what happened at Monrepo, I believe, was engineers by provocateurs and mercenaries who were paid to create mayhem and with the media poised to defame black people. Not the first time, you know. Mm -hmm. We have uh, a judicial system, a legal system, poised to assassinate the name of black people. And even when there's justice, look, the girl, the, 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 the security guard bother is a black woman. Yes. It's spat upon by an indo guyanese attorney using the opportunity she has as a citizen, she takes him to court. And the DPP and indo guyanese uses the power under the constitution to withdraw the case. Now, what, 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 I mean, you, they don't even let the courts adjudicate in the matter. You have the two top judicial officers, both women, both Afro-Guyanese. Norton said he's prepared to support um, the next move to have them appointed. And the president says that he can wait. And the next thing we hear, after the function with the Chinese last Wednesday, is that Norton and the leadership of the coalition are being disrespectful by saying that um, he was not properly elected. Now, that is not the way a president behaves, but he's being petty, as I said. And I, I, as I said, either petty or pusillanimous. And I've sent him a letter, asking him to reconsider his position. I will make a copy of that letter available to you tomorrow if you give me your email. Certainly would. But David, you in Guyana? Yes, I am. I am in Guyana. Okay, man. OK. Yes. Yes. So, so Hami, let's, let's, um, let's, let's talk about extrajudicial killing. You were prime minister of this country. You were minister, I'm not sure you were ever home affairs minister, but you were high up in the government. Um, this question of extrajudicial killing is something that we inherited from, from um, uh, colonialism. How did your government deal with the question of extrajudicial killing within the force? It's obvious that it's a culture. In every case, I did, we dealt with the officers guilty very swiftly. And as far as I recall, it was not a pattern as we saw post-1992. And uh, what you say about Granger, he never encouraged that. And that extrajudicial killing must in some way have the tacit support of those at the top. Either the top of the um, political ladder or the top of the police force. The fellas know they can do as they care. You saw that incident with the police riding behind Aubrey Norton, the leader of the opposition, and saying that they were they, they were following orders. 
the commissioner said he did not give the order. The divisional commander said he did not give the order. The Home Affairs Minister said he didn't know about it. Uh, who, who in the government could give, could give orders to the police? Well, those mm -hmm. people you need to say who gave him the orders. But you, you're not going to hear anything more about that, you know. That will be swept mm -hmm. on the carpet as so many other issues have been. They must say, mm -hmm. I don't think a police rank would do such a thing on their own unless they're rabid uh, government supporters. Yeah. And he was so clumsy, so foolish. In, in these days, you don't have to do that. But shows that they're bold, they're Clumsy, they're foolish. So, Mr. Green, we uh, we had a, a protest event in Buxton um, on 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 Monday, mm -hmm. and we had the government in a real cynical way um, trying to close down the protest by um, saying that police permission was needed when they knew that permission, police permission was not needed for a picketing exercise. They had um, the radio blasting, telling people not to go to the protest. And then the government sent seven ministers in there to share out hampers. Um, did you all, when you were in the PNC in government, did you all employ such tactics? Absolutely no. It is <laughs> no class. It is treating people like, as I said, like children, giving them sweets. Yeah. You know, it's, it's inappropriate. It's inappropriate. And it shows, and I hope the people at Buxton and Ansgrove and other places recognize it. We got to tell them the low regard that the government has for them. Give them a few hampers so we're hungry. And um, that will keep you quiet. Uh, you go to Etika, you do the same thing. While the roads in the other villages are well surfaced, you go to Andanimi, the roads are not properly serviced, but you go next door, they're properly serviced. And somehow they treat us as though we're children, you know, and that is unacceptable. And the the people, people, yeah, tell this to the people. The people of Golden Grove are leading the way. They are standing firm, demanding justice for um, the young man from their village. Um, and, and the protest seems to be spreading um, to other parts of the country and morphing into a movement. Um, what, 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 what do you want to say specifically to those heroic people of Golden Grove? I think the protests should continue. That's our constitutional right. And once that protest, you have monitors who ensure that the provocateurs don't get in between, it is their right. Uh, I attended a function a few days ago, and I remain, reminded people very quietly that the great United States grew out of protest. The Boston Tea Party was a massive protest. And, you know, you, particularly if you're dealing with a government, as the Americans had to deal with George III, who ignored their pleas, you have to let them know that what they're doing is out of order. And I told the group at, at another function at the African Episcopal Church group that they don't mind us praying, you know, and because when we, our eyes are closed, my mother told me this, when they open the gown, all the gold. <laughs> they don't mind us praying because first of all, they don't believe in prayer. We must pray. But I keep sending this message that God and heaven help those who help themselves. 
and in dealing with right under Mr. Devil, you've got to let them know it will not be business as usual. And so the people of Gungu must keep it up, keep it up, and keep it up. And if we have to make it uncomfortable for some people, nothing wrong with that. When Jaden came back from the conference in London, when he was happy with the results, he came back and said he's going to start a hurricane of protests. That ended up in burning canes and violence all over the place. We don't think that is correct, but that was the way of doing things. Any any message for the young people? I know you are very firm on young people taking the rightful place in the front lines of the resistance movement. Any word for them? Yes. My message to young people is that A, study and understand the intricacies of our history, maybe Indo, Afro, Guyanese, or what have you. To look at the mistakes made both by our leaders and the machinations of the imperial master. That has not, those things have not changed. And secondly, they must get out of this cocoon that I perceive of being afraid. I went out there once with Glenn Lal and people passed and called me later and said they were afraid uh, to go and demonstrate. Two young women came up to take my uh, photograph. I thought they were from the media. They were from a special branch when I checked. It's clumsy and unacceptable. We've got to get our young people to recognize that this bounty that given to us by the Creator, unless they do something, the majority of them will not be the beneficiaries of that God-given gift. And I think our young people must recognize, in the same way that gold was found by the pork knockers, but that gold is not being harvested by aliens. We don't mind aliens coming in, but they must not get the hog in the business as what we see happening with oil and gas. Right now, we have to educate our young people. There's a big movement globally against fossil fuel. Funds are being granted for solar energy. And we have a government going ahead, blinkers on, with a gas to show project. And our young people seem to be silent, complacent, and worse, disinterested. You gotta talk with them. Your program is an excellent one. Keep it up. If we gotta pay to repeat it on another station, let's get some people to subscribe to it. Because you have been in the forefront, your analysis is excellent. But more young people, more teachers need to hear your message and give them the bounce, as I said, to agitate if we are to be truly liberated. If we are to be truly liberated, and that's the decisive um, turn them, Ami, um, as we close out, um, any parting um, thoughts? Well, let me more than what I said. We've got to find a mechanism to reach our young people. Too many young people, including those who are in secondary school, seem disinterested, uh, some confused as to what they can do to have a better life. And I have always asked the adults I speak to and with, get hold of a son, a nephew and a niece on a one-in-one. -on -one and speak to them about the history of this country, to tell them the sacrifices made and the suffering of our ancestors, and that we need to vindicate that, that, that once a year at um, Emancipation Day, but every day. 
and give them the bunks to work together in unity so that tomorrow will be bright and glorious. It is possible. It can take time, it can take patience, it can take the intellectual stimulation that can come out of sharing knowledge. And this Hamilton is Green, so important. Hamilton Green, former Prime Minister of Guyana, now an elder, sharing his wisdom here tonight. Hamilton, thank you so much, and I'll be calling on you as usual as uh, um, the situation unfolds. Um, <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Hamilton Green, the former Prime Minister of Guyana, sharing his thoughts with us tonight. And we are always grateful when those who um, uh, were in the trenches before um, come on here and share um, their wisdom. Tomorrow night, we continue the conversation. Mr. Paul Slow is going to be here on, on here, and uh, we are going to have a lawyer. So tonight, tomorrow night, we're going to look at it from the legal perspective, keeping up the coverage on the Quindon Bacchus incident, on the building of our movement. Um, as I said last night, a movement, a movement, a movement. Organize, organize, organize. Everyone has a role to play. Don't be daunted by the nastiness that comes from some quarters. God has his work to do and the devil has his work to do. We are on the side of godliness. We are on the side of righteousness. And always the burden of cleansing a dirty society has to be with those who have the capacity to recognize um, that our country will not move forward until we clean the mess. It has not always been easy to mold our nation together. As I said, we are still over it. <clears throat> we are still there about as a nation, not quite there yet. And there are those who want to take us back to the colonial moment. We have to say we've come too far. We're not turning back. We've come too far. We cannot turn back. This experiment of Guyana has to be successful, but its success must not mean domination by one group. We are at a pivotal moment, a moment when we have the opportunity to right all the wrongs and to straighten the crooked roads. And there are those in our society who would want to stall that movement. We have to say to them, no, no. No, we have to move beyond complaining. We have to begin to act. We are on our way. We are acting. And as we begin to act, we see them running around like headless chickens. We see them coming and declaring themselves African Guyanese. The prime minister said, I am an African Guyanese. I've read all the African books. I'm Afrocentric. Uh, if you're Afrocentric, you don't have to say you're Afrocentric. The fact that you have to say you're Afrocentric is that you are conscious that you are not naturally Afrocentric. And so we are forcing them, we are forcing them to come to us and begin to act. But we know that they're trying to fool us with their actions. And we are not going to be fooled. They want to separate our professionals from the masses. They want to separate those of us who may have a few letters behind our names. They want to separate us from you. They're not separating me from you. And they're not separating the rest of us from you. You, I, I'm, I'm saying this again and again. 
people like myself, people like Mr. Green, people like um, all the activists, Aubrey Norton and all of them. We are where we are because of you, because of you, the sacrifices you made, paving the way, doing what is necessary to hold family and community together. And it's, it's right that we come back to you and stand in your ranks. And they're not gonna frighten me away. They're not gonna frighten us away. We're gonna stay here. We're gonna come here every evening. We're gonna come here every morning. We're gonna stand in your ranks. We're gonna stand in your ranks and we're going to fight this fight with you. And as, been, as I've been saying in recent days, the Lion of Judah shall break every chain and give us the victory again and again. The Lion of Judah shall break every chain and give us the victory again and again. We have won victories before. We won the big victory against plantation. We have turned the plantation into a nation and we've got to mold this nation and keep it together. Uh, we sympathize with our East Indian brothers and sisters who feel that an attack, some, some, not all, maybe a minority, of East Indians who feel that an attack on the government is an attack on them. That's backward thinking. It's not an attack on you. It's not an attack on you. Uh, Mr. Green can give testimony. When you cried, we cried with you. When you mourned, we mourned with you. Some of us went against a so-called black government. We stood with you. And today, you have a moral duty to stand with us. You can vote for the PPP. That's your right. That's your right. That's your fundamental right to choose who you associate with. But when you look across and you see your black brother, black sister mourning, you have a duty to mourn with us because we have mourned with you. We have mourned with you. We have mourned with you. When in 2002, in my village, Indian passerbys were being, uh, passersby were being attacked. Some of them were killed. Along with Andaye and Brother UC, I stood up, we stood up and said, not in our name. We have that moral history, moral history. I say that I go to sleep at night, knowing that uh, I didn't say, just didn't live my life saying I have Indian friends and I went to true, went to school with Indian people. That is not what makes you multiracial. What makes you multiracial is when you are prepared to stand when the other side is in trouble, to stand with them when you are prepared to risk your own popularity in your own community to say it is wrong. And I will never, never help to socialize black people to hate. A brother asked me this morning that if your brother is killing you, why should you love him? And I said to that brother, we've got to love one another because our faith is linked, linked by our experiences and that we have the righteous love, but we also have tough love, that our brothers in uniform were shooting at their mothers and their girlfriends and their sisters. We have to let them know that time is longer than twine, that the PPP will not always be there to protect them. And the modern law, doesn't have any statute of limitation when it comes to crime against humanity. And they, by shooting at the people of Golden Grove, shooting down their brothers, they are committing crimes against humanity. Our young policemen, those minority of them that are involved in that obscenity, stop it, stop it. I'm going to not going to stop crying out to you. Please stop it, it is immoral. It is ungodly and it's a crime against humanity to walk into a village in the dark of night and to be shooting at children and women, your mothers, 
you love your gun more than your mother and your daughters and your children. And we as a community cannot tolerate that. These men have to come home to us. They have to come home to our daughters at night. They have to come home to our grandchildren. And we've got to straighten them out. We've got to straighten them out. We did not come out of slavery to be shooting up at ourselves. We came out of slavery with dignity. And these boys were taking orders from others to kill our people. They are not the best example of what we stand for. So we're speaking to them publicly. We're saying, stop it. Stop it. Let Quindon Bacchus be the last extrajudicial killing. The last time a brother points a gun at another brother and kill him on the orders of the political masters. We've got to stop it. It is not going to be stopped. It is not going to be stopped by any commission of inquiry into policing. It is not going to be stopped by police reform. It is going to be stopped when we black people put a stop to it. Let those young men, when they come back into our communities, we have to school them. We have to hold them, as they would say, preferably shake them and bring them back to their senses. It is we who have to stop it. No commission of inquiry is going to stop it. No government is going to stop it. All those things I see Ravi Dev talking about reforming police, it's nonsense. The matter is not about reforming police, it's about reforming the hearts of those who hold power. It's about reforming the senses of those boys with the guns. That's when extrajudicial killings is going to stop. But I say that I am not getting into the business of police reform. If they want, let them do that. This problem is structural, it's cultural, and it's political. And that's where the solution must come. Good night. Tomorrow night, we're going to continue this conversation. But Paul Slow and uh, an attorney at law is going to be on. I love you all. I love you all. I will continue to love you all. I will continue to love you because you are the seed from which I come. And if I don't love you, nobody else will love you. And so as I love you, I want you to love me back. Love ourselves. Brother Marcus Garvey talked about self-love. It is the first form of love. Love thyself. Love thyself. Love your family. Love your community. And love those of us who come out of a particular experience, unique in the world. We have had a unique, no other ethnic group, no other racial group was subjected to the crimes that were heaped on us. And so therefore, nobody says they love black people. Nobody says black is beautiful. And I am saying, I want to say it, Every day, every day, black is beautiful. Black lives matter too. And we are human beings too, with the finest attributes that God has bestowed on humanity. Good night, good night. Tomorrow night, the love continues. <laughs>